Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. This is, gosh, what time is it? It is 2 or um, 1400, depending on where you're located in the world. But here we are. I hope everybody's feeling rested, energized, or here, or just here. Okay, no worries. <laughs> well, we got another session for you guys, another great session. And um, before that, I want to talk about a couple announcements. We have a job board. And if anyone would like to go look at the job board, see if anybody's hiring, or to write that you are hiring, that um, is located on the first floor, I believe. And then on that note, we have sponsor halls, two of them. We have one on the second floor and the first floor, so do check out our sponsors. Without them, we would have a really hard time putting on this event, so go check them out and say thank you. And for now, we're gonna introduce our next speaker who is Joe A. Simpson, Jr. Yes, come on up. <laughs> I was laid out flat on a cold, hard operating table similar to the one that you see here. And as I slowly counted backwards, 100, 99, 98, 97, and my eyes slowly began to close, all I could think about were these eyes and memories. Um, it was really difficult to tell my daughter. We decided to wait until the end of the school year. She was um, preparing for college. She was going to art school, and we didn't want to really disrupt anything. Um, just imagine that conversation, telling your daughter and your son that you might not make it home. And I may not be <laughs> the greatest guy, but I don't think my wife planned that till death do us part would happen this quick in our relationship. As I woke up, I, I learned that I had two blocked arteries, two 100% blocked arteries, and I had to decide what was next for me. And I thought about this quote, if today was the last day, would I want to do what I'm currently doing? And at that point, my life totally changed. I decided I wanted to do things differently. And I thought back to things that I really cared about and really gave me joy. I only wanted to do things that helped me heal emotionally, physically, and emotionally. And one of those things was WordPress. Um, my origin story in WordPress happened when our lead developer and our CSS goddess, they both left our company within one month of each other, and I inherited a WordPress site, and I had to build a child theme. Fortunately, we had a little money that I could go to training, and I went to the WordPress VIP intensive developer training in Napa Valley, and imagine this, a guy that was a graphic designer turned HTML person, turned WordPress person, as a beginner, uh, being in, all, in this room with all the the great minds in the WordPress development community, and I was asked to spin up a virtual box, <laughs> and I froze. But something amazing happened. Each and every person at that developer VIP uh, training session offered to help. They lent a hand to someone that had no development skills and made me feel welcome. And that was my first interaction with the WordPress community. So as I determined what I was going to do next, I thought back to that instance and said, I think I want to do WordPress, and I want to do it crazy. So I began to put one foot in front of the other to get to the restroom, then eventually at the local park, 10 feet turned into 20 feet, turned into one lap. And as I thought 
uh, about what was next, I began to set small goals. And as I looked out five minutes before sunrise from my local lake here, I saw the world through a whole new set of eyes. And I began to set more and more goals on what was next. From high atop Central Park in my local area, in 90 days I was able to climb these hills and things became more possible. Things became clearer. My choices became clearer. I decided to do WordPress with a passion. I attended my first WordPress meetup. At that meetup, I volunteered for WordCamp Los Angeles, and it just kept going. In the next 90 days, I attended 18 meetups all over Southern California in all the three uh, major counties, which was lots of miles. I went to um, WordCamp Riverside, I spoke. I went to WordCamp Los Angeles. I flew to Michigan to WordCamp Grand Rapids. I did a little bit of everything. Anything and everything in WordPress I wanted to do. I wanted to make an impact. I attended my first virtual WordCamp US during that time as well. But the other thing that I wanted to reach back for was my pencil. I was an artist growing up, a graphic designer by trade in college, and I said, hey, how can I be creative? How can that help me grow emotionally? And so I decided to draw, to brand our, our word camps. It's even translated to a weird obsession with WAPUs. I've submitted 11 WAPUs, one for this camp. I think you can determine which one it is by everyone on scooters around here. But again, I wanted to do anything and everything creatively and in WordPress to help me heal. We also did a lot of great things in Santa Clarita. One of the first that I'm really proud of was our third WordCamp. We had an accessibility WordCamp. It was focused on that. We had an entire track of accessibility presentations, not the one, two, or three that you see at most camps. We had 15 speakers. That was impressive. We started the first WordPress-specific accessibility meetup. Again, anything and everything in WordPress I was trying to do. Um, I, I started three meetups, Black Press, two in, in Santa Clarita. We had the first mega meetup. During the pandemic, there were a lot of virtual meetups, so we collaborated with other meetups to do things. I participated on any panel. During the pandemic years, I think there were maybe 20 uh, work camps, virtual. I think I volunteer spoke or helped organize almost every one of them. <laughs> I was doing anything and everything in WordPress because I thought back to those moments where they helped me out. But what did this have to do with the presentation today? Why did you just hear that origin story? Oftentimes, when we think of WordPress, we think of accessibility and websites. We don't think about the physical spaces where we meet and congregate as a community. How are those spaces as open and accessible as possible? So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. We know this term. We know make WordPress accessible. But today, I want to talk to you about making all WordPress events accessible. Here's my slides, if you want to follow along. Um, I, have, I sort of do things over the top, as you can just see from what I showed you. Um, I have the slides in multiple variations. There's an accessible version, which is online here. It's just straight text. Today, I'm going to show you a lot of those bullet points, but I don't want to bore you with <laughs> lines and lines of that. But here at the uh, slide deck, you'll get all that information in a straightforward format that if you have a screen reader, you can get to. Here's the link also. I'll give you a minute. All right. Here's a little bit about me. My name's Joe Simpson. I work for the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in Los Angeles. But when I made that change, I took on another uh, life within the WordPress community. I'm an ambassador for SiteGround. But I really want to always make sure that I thank people that are a part of this journey. So what I'm going to talk to you about today was built by these folks. Ron Howard 
Rob Howard of Howard Development Consulting makes it possible for a lot of people in the um, persons of color to attend word camps and speak. I felt for me, I wanted to make sure that persons of color was in every step of WordPress events, not just in front of the mic, but behind the scenes. So Rob makes that happen. I really wanted to thank the US team. The lead sextet were an incredible group of people to work with. I had the fortune of being a mentor to the accessibility team, and I believe that was the first where there was a dedicated accessibility team at a WordCamp, and these folks, Alex Stein, Michelle Frechette, and Amy G June Heinlein were really incredible in terms of what we wanted to get accomplished and the things that we got accomplished. And also, there were people in the WordPress community that I reached out on Slack that when they saw things, I was just hitting them with questions. Because again, you always want to hear what everyone has to say, because when we think of events or we think of a planning, oftentimes we make it how we want it to be. So I really want to be as open and as inclusive as possible, so I, I listen to everybody. All right. This statement is pretty important in terms of how I approach organizing and the things that I do in the WordPress community. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, things to consider. Again, these are stats uh, based on the US, but it applies everywhere because we all get older, and nearly one in five Americans will become disabled for one year or more before the age of 65. The story that I told you was later in my professional career, but it was the first time that I was disabled. I was technically disabled in this, uh, by definition in the state of California. These are two other uh, bullet points to consider, but again, a lot of times we don't think of ourselves as being disabled or even the potential of being disabled, but it's natural that as we get older, our eyesight fails, our hips hurt, and things like that. One of the interesting things, I was part of a, uh, an accessibility cohort, an uh, equity cohort at Metro, and we did a presentation, an accessibility presentation on equitable transportation. And one of the team members uh, really wanted to focus on blind folks in this, in this setting, but I said, you know, there's not just blind folks are disabled. Didn't you know that there were this many? At least these, this many dis disabilities. So a lot of times we only think of one or two or three types of disabilities, but when we're planning events like this, we need to think about everybody that's going to attend. All right. Just to give you a little bit of history of the disability movement, there was an incredible documentary on Netflix called Crip Camp a couple of years ago. And the thing that was so amazing about this documentary was back in the 70s, just, just step back for a moment, in the 70s, if you had a disability, you were probably doomed to a life of being in your house and not being able to leave. Most homes were disabled. Um, you couldn't go to the bank. You couldn't ride public transportation. So imagine how helpless they may feel in terms of uh, moving forward in life or even having goals or aspirations. And the incredible thing about this documentary was that there was a camp in upstate New York, Camp Jeanette, where they invited the disability, you know, dis disabled kids to come out, which was the first. But it wasn't, you know, they made them, they empowered them. And there was a group of teenagers that attended this camp that went on to change the world. They went on to school and Judas Human became the face of the disabled civil rights movement. The incredible thing was that it was influenced by the civil rights movement in America, Martin Luther King. They even based a little bit of their language on the civil rights legislation that had gone through. They started shutting down government buildings, blocking intersections. Um, they couldn't go to, to restaurants because they couldn't go to the bathroom. Um, it culminated in what you see here on the right, which was a Capitol crawl, probably the most famous uh, image of that movement, where dozens of people with disabilities tried to climb the stairs at the Capitol. Back then, just think, no buildings had ramps. One of the cool things about this event is that we have a ramp to the stage. We don't really think about those things, but what I try to do in the community is think about that. And it resulted in the, the passage of the um, ADA, and it changed the world forever. If I can, this is a, a great um, quote as well. If I can't do great things, 
I can do small things in a great way. I always try to think about my approach and what I do in this community in this way. And I always make, try to make little gains. And over time, those gains become something that can become legacy. So here are some things that I like to do or that I recommend you do as an organizer. And again, you can see some areas are grayed out, but on the slides that I provided, you can get all that information. These are a couple of key ones. Be inclusive when you pick your teams. A lot of times, we may exclude folks from the team because they may, you know, they may not agree with what we do, or I try to always include people of differing voices. Two of the people that were on the team, the accessibility team at WordCamp US, um, I had seen their information out on the web. One person wrote a, an article critical of how one WordCamp went. There was another person on LinkedIn who's a co-rep on the accessibility team. Um, I encouraged them to join, and I was really excited to work with them because, again, there may be different approaches, but we all want the same thing. Offer a seat at the table, and that's what I, what I just described. Also, a leverage existing efforts. One thing I'm a big nerd about is I look at every piece of documentation in the, the WordPress space uh, to help educate me. I'm, on, I'm lurking on Slack channels just to, to find information to keep moving forward. In terms of the venues, uh, one thing that I was really happy about was that when, we just, when I worked on the team for WordCamp US, we were allowed to tour the venue. If I ruled the world, I would even take a step back and when, those, when you're thinking of cities to host your event, I would create a list of possible venues that are accessible. The cool thing about um, touring uh, the venue in National Harbor was as a team, when we got out, I did a lot of documentation. I took pictures of everything, but then you also got to see um, how the spaces were, how the, the exits, how wide the exits were, how the bathrooms worked, and all those things are things that you don't want your attendees to think about. This information helps them make a decision on whether they want to attend or not. And again, as long as you have as much of that information up front as possible, you don't want somebody to show up to your event and figure they can't get through the front door. So again, as you're planning these events, try to get as much information that you can share to the public as soon as possible. These are some uh, screenshots from Crip Camp. And these, again, were during this process, I was seeking out any and every information. And, and these were just some basics on the width of doors. You know, we, we take for granted that a lot of these accessibility improvements help everyone. How many of us leave the market and that cut curve allows us to just go without our groceries going everywhere? Um, these kind of things make it a better event for everyone. Here are some more um, pieces of documentation that I took during WordCamp US. Again, I looked at the front entrance uh, for for accessibility, they had paddles there, that was awesome. You want to look at your event spaces like this. Are, do you have enough aisle space for someone in a scooter? Are, are, are your doors wide enough to get through? Another cool thing about US was they offered a number of different accessible, accessible rooms. So during the tour, we, we looked at all the different room types, and again, I was documenting everything, and we put that all out on our, our website. In terms of wayfinding, which I'm a, a big advocate of as a former graphic designer, how are people going to move through your space? Um, a lot of the flagship events are at really large venues. I remember back at <laughs> WordCamp US in St. Louis, it was a hall from one end to the other. It felt like it was a mile. So imagine someone with a cane or a scooter trying to get from one end to the other. So for me, it's really important that as you walk around the venue, there are key bits of information that show you where you're going or where you need to go. Um, I, I've also um, a big advocate for, or I'm a big critic of, um, events that only put up maps in, as an image or as a PDF. Someone that uses a screen reader, if you don't put alt text or you prepare your PDFs in the correct way, they can't see it. So I always accompany that with common path information. I do. Uh, text descriptions for all of the images so that someone with the screen reader can sort of listen to the turn by turn. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. What you see here, again, as a former graphic designer, 
I would seek out uh, these maps from the venue because a lot of the venues have really terrible graphics. They may be designed in beautiful colors, but there may not be proper color contrast. So again, folks that may be colorblind may not see it. So I took that information and I combined it into a floor plan uh, for the entire venue. But what you see in pink are the common paths at WordCamp US. So again, how are people going to get from meeting room to meeting room? How are they going to enter the building? How are they going to move to the sponsor hall or get their food? So again, people can see it visually, but also, um, this is a close-up. Again, it tells you where the restrooms are. Um, so again, it gives people some bearing visually, but the thing that I thought was a first, that I think is a first that I'm really proud of is our, uh, there was a blind member on our team, Alex Stein, and he pointed out some information on the in National Federation of the Blind website. They have an annual c conference, but in addition to the visual maps, they put up a turn-by-turn -turn or a description that's in text. So again, me being over the top, um, the venue had an app. Unfortunately, that app wasn't accessible, but it did provide me approximate information that I pulled out. And what you see here is a description of the key areas during WordCamp US in actual approximate distance. So they can, their screen reader, they'll hear it, and again, they can make a decision on how they're going to go from room to room. And again, all that stuff is behind the scene. It's not a big deal, but for me, it's important. And here's another, uh, oops, here's another <laughs> example of that. Another cool thing, one of the team members, uh, Bree, went through with the video camera and video from one end to the other. So again, if you wanted to see how the venue looked, you could see it visually. So again, provi provide your attendees as much information about the event as possible. All right. Back in Santa Cruz, where I started, um, first uh, I attended um, Work Camp Los Angeles, like I mentioned, and I wanted to do more. So I decided, I did a couple of meetups, and I said, hey, let's do a Work Camp. It was the first Work Camp north of Los Angeles and south of San Francisco and since 2014. But the cool thing is, and I'm a Cali kind of guy, um, the accessibility uh, history that I talked about, it started in California. They shut down one of the government buildings and did a sit-in uh, for days. But the result of that is a lot of the buildings are newer and they're all compliant. Uh, so the local community college had a great facility when we did work in Santa Cruz. And what you see here is two of our key members, uh, Betty and Oren, they were in wheel wheelchairs or motorized devices. But the community college had great access. They were able to pull their scooters in, park it right up front, and take in work camp. So again, I always think of events in terms of how people are going to attend and get the most out of WordPress. Here's some more in terms of the attendee experience. Most events, uh, work camp events, have an attendee experience team. Um, these are a few things that I always would recommend. Um, does your, your hotel or venue have a variety of accessible rooms? Um, that's uh, key. Also, uh, it, does your venue uh, experience team or your venue have uh, the ability to call someone and get help? A lot of times if, if you're a, a disabled person and you're dropped off in front of the hotel, will someone help you? Can you call somebody to get immediate help? Those are key. Um, a cool thing, there was someone in the, in the community space who I contacted. He was um, neurodivergent and he said, Joe, you need to do this, this, and this. One of the key things is that I want to have distance when I go to an event. I'm not comfortable being around a lot of people. So he suggested um, distance badges, and that was done at US also to, to let people know that, hey, five feet, you can come up, that kind of thing. So again, there are different types of disabilities, but again, as long as you consider it, you'll make the event better for everyone. Making sure that you inform your volunteer teams. Um, talk about these things in advance. You know, you, there are a lot of planning meetings that go into putting on a word camp. So just make sure you talk about how you're going to handle things. There's a, a link in the slides of a great article that I saw on LinkedIn about South by Southwest. And there was sort of a Spider-Man meme where the front desk was sending a disabled person to the accessibility desk who was sending them to another desk. So make sure that all your teams are in line and know how to respond to certain issues. All right. In terms of the live stream, 
And see, I've got an opinion on everything. <laughs> In terms of your live stream, offer a low capacity room. That was another thing that uh, Ryan Bourne and I talked about in terms of how neurodivergent, peop neurodivergent people see these events. Um, he was saying, I might not want to be in a large auditorium room, but if you had the live stream in another room where it may be 10, 20 people, that may be comfortable for me. So we did that at US. Um, also, one of the things that I never really see, and I understand that may be budget constraints, there should be ASL for at least your keynote. And most events have live captioning, which is awesome. Uh, this is a slide. One of my pet peeves also is I don't like the fact that captions are on the same screen, just above my head, which could be distracting for someone that may need to, to read the captions. I would separate them. All right. Also, for the speakers, like people like me, um, there's some great tips on making your, your presentations accessible. Um, again, alt text is probably something that you've heard about for 15, 20 years, but no one really does it. Someone with a screen reader really benefits from those things. Then in terms of websites, I was talking with someone yesterday, and there's an active WordPress WordCamp site that's out there now that the text isn't accessible. That means the color contrast isn't correct, so someone that has a colorblind issue may not be able to read that information. So these, there's always really basic things, and these things that I'm showing you today are really simple and easy to do. They just take a little bit of effort, a little bit of extra effort. I'm going to leave you with this. I, I found this quote by Matt, which I thought was very appropriate to the style or the way that I see uh, WordCamps working. There's so many talented people that I've come across in this community that I sort of draft off of. I ask lots of questions. I'm sort of annoying in terms of that, but um, we're all smarter because of the people that are sitting next to us. So as a community, let's leverage that and make things more accessible. The story I'll leave you with is, um, this is something that sort of pumps me up. And this is sort of things that give me energy to keep going. During WordCamp US, we had uh, the Community Summit in addition. We had Alex Stein, and again, Alex is one of the co-team reps for the accessibility team, but he was also on my accessibility team as uh, one of the organizers. He needed a, a guide for the community summit. We had someone for him for WordCamp, and so I decided to volunteer. The disgusting thing <laughs> was that there were folks with their phones walking between us, people closing the elevator doors on us. So it was just amazing. And he was saying, Joe, you just wouldn't know how much this happens to me and how frustrating it is. Um, that's why I kind of do this. It's like we can always learn and we can always be better. How can you get involved? Yesterday was Contributor Day. We had some great uh, sessions there, as well as we met as the accessibility team at the table. Um, here's where you can help us, specifically. We're always looking for folks to help test and things of that nature. Make, I also put the QR code up if, in case you want to jump over. We have weekly meetings, we have bug scrubs, and we also have office hours to help you if you have accessibility questions. Here's that information I just mentioned. So again, if you have the slide deck, you can quickly jump over. Here are some additional resources. I always flood folks with, <laughs> with the resources. But these are some great links, some great reading by folks that I respect in the community. Thank you for your time. You can, <laughs> these are the last slide. You can find me here, Joe Simpson Jr. on any of these platforms. Um, this is our meetup in Santa Clarita. I always give props to the black press community, find them there, and I'll open it for questions. But I wanted to do it a little differently. I wanted to hear your wins as well, not just questions about um, accessibility, but if there's something that you've done in your community, or even an issue that you found, I would love to hear about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody have any questions or stories to share? Oh, wow. 
Well, that was easy. Um, with that, we have a gift for you. Well, thank you so much. And Joe, thanks for speaking. And if anybody does want to come up to Joe afterwards and ask, you're available? Yes. Yeah. I'll be around later in a side crown share. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody.